of, uh, of improper integration. So let's go through these at a reasonable pace to hopefully clear up any questions that are lingering in your mind about, uh, about improper integration. Let me just double check. We did finish that one. Yeah. So let's take a look at this. Use integration by parts. We're going to use integration by parts at some point during this one. Uh, and we want to find the improper integral to figure out this area that we see uh, here. So we're looking at that area there. And we want to know whether that area is finite or whether that area is infinite. So once again, we use the word unbounded to represent the fact that this area goes on forever. We don't say that this area is infinite unless the square units are infinite. So we call that an unbounded region, and we want to know what the area of that unbounded region is. And the whole idea with this, with this strategy is that we are going to pick an arbitrary point right there called B, and we are going to integrate from 1 to B, and that will be a definite integral from 1 to B, and that will turn into a function of B, and then we take the limit as B goes to infinity. So we have to find this function of B. All right. So to do that, to find this function of B, we introduce the limit, and we're going to let B go to infinity, and this will be an integral from 1 to B of ln of x divided by x squared dx. So that is the first thing you should write down is limit. Anytime we have an improper integral, that's how we evaluate. We have to take a limit. So don't forget to write the limit. Notation is important. So the way that this is going to be integrated is with integration by parts. So this is kind of a classic integration by parts. We have a product, and we want to integrate a product. We have natural log of x multiplied by 1 over x squared. That's the product in the integrand. And so when we set up our integration by parts, we are going to pick a u and pick a dv. And once again, the best strategy is to put with the dv the most complex part of this integrand that we can integrate. And when we think about the two factors that I mentioned, natural log and 1 over x squared, we don't, the, the integral of natural log is, is we, we have figured it out, but it's not, a, it's not readily an antiderivative that we use a lot. We could say, oh, it's x ln x minus x. We could do that. But typically, if you see a log in there, you're going to want to throw the log over here, and we're going to use whatever is left over here. So we're going to treat that as the biggest chunk that's easily integrable. I don't think any of us would say natural log is easily integrable, uh, because to do it, you have to use a clever integration by parts. All right, so there is our integration by parts set up. We will find du to be 1 over x dx. And when we integrate over here, we add 1 to the exponent, which gives us negative 1. And we divide by negative 1. So we're going to have negative 1 over x. That will be v. So let's drop, come back over here. We have limit. Sorry, what was the on the original equation? What's the upper limit? Is it b? Infinity. It's infinity. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it goes on forever, which says it's unbounded. All right. So now we're going to take the limit of this. So we're going to do uv. So that's minus 1 over x natural log of x, uv. And this will be integrated on the interval, or evaluated on the interval, 1 to b. So uv minus the integral of vdu. And vdu is the bottom row there. 
which is negative 1 over x squared. The negative sign can come to the front, and we're going to be left with 1 over x squared, which we're going to write as x to the negative 2 dx. And that integral is integrable pretty easily. If you wanted to, you could evaluate this uv part right away. I usually recommend just waiting because you're going to evaluate at the limits 1 and b anyway. So why not just wait? So we have our minus 1 over x times natural log of x. And then here we integrate, and again we get minus 1 over x, right? Add 1 to that exponent, divide by the new exponent. And then all of this is evaluated on the interval 1 to b. So we'll keep the limit symbol out in front. First we have to get the inside evaluated. So we plug in the b. We'll have 1 over b natural log of b minus 1 over b. So that's the antiderivative at the upper limit. And then we subtract the antiderivative at the lower limit. And when we subtract, that subtraction is going to create a plus and a plus. We're subtracting two negatives, so we're going to end up with plus 1 over 1 natural log of 1 plus 1 over 1. So we get that. Natural log of 1 is 0, so this part right here is equal to 0. And we are taking the limit as b goes to infinity. So let's think about that. We can evaluate that now. <clears throat> All right, so where does 1 over b go as b goes to infinity? That goes to 0. And I'm going to rewrite this now. I want to point out something. We haven't used this technique. I don't think we've used it yet, but it's a super important technique in Calc 2 that you should have learned in Calc 1. And what I'm going to do is rewrite this as a fraction. And of course, the limit of 1 is itself. A constant that doesn't have a b in it is not affected by b going to infinity. So the limit of a constant is itself. And this first term here that I've written as a ratio, that goes to infinity over infinity. That is indeterminate. If you get a 0 divided by 0, an infinity divided by infinity, an infinity divided by negative infinity, whatever, those are indeterminate. L'Hopital's rule is the order of the day. So L'Hopital's rule says that if you have a quotient of functions, each going to infinity, the quotient of derivatives should go to the same thing, which makes perfect sense. If you have two functions, they're both going to infinity, and then you look at their tangent lines, which is, those are the best approximations for those functions, the quotient of tangent lines should go to the same thing as the quotient of functions. All right? In our minds, we think of the derivative as the best linear approximation to a function. So if we have a quotient of functions, the quotient of best approximation should do the same thing. So that's the, the idea behind L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule says we are going to look at the limit of the quotient of derivatives. <coughs> so we take the derivative of the numerator, we take the derivative of the denominator, and we're taking the derivative with respect to b. So there, and we're not going to take the derivative of the 1. Okay, so we're taking the derivative of this with respect to b. That's 1 over b. And the derivative of b with respect to b is 1. And so this, before we, let's just write it one more step. So that's negative 1 over b plus 1 as b goes to infinity. And what does that go to? That piece right there goes to? Zero. That piece goes to zero. So our overall limit is one. So that is the area. So now we can say that this area 
is finite. If we ended up with an infinity there, then it would be appropriate to say that the area is infinite. But we ended up with a number, a finite number, so we know that that area is actually finite, and that area is one square unit, even though it's an unbounded region. All right, any step in that process that you want to ask about? So L'Hopital's rule, just remember, so right here, uh, infinity over infinity is indeterminate. So we're going to use L'Hopital's rule. The derivative over the derivative, not the quotient rule. Two separate functions. Take the derivative of each. What and are some other ways it could be indeterminate? Well, the only ones that we're going to see in this context are infinity over infinity, zero over zero. Okay. Those are the ones we're going to look at. There are other ones that crop up from time to time that we will see, like one to the zero. You know, and all those ones that you were that generated, like um, you know, things like this. You have one plus one over. Uh, let's see, how do they usually, what are the letters they usually use for this? Well, we could do it like this, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, let's just write it like that first. So what about this limit as x goes to infinity? So this you first learn in college algebra. <clears throat> they don't use the word limit, they use the word horizontal asymptote, and you look at the graph of that. And what does that go to? What is that limit equal to? So if you think about the indeterminate form, the indeterminate form is 1 to the infinity. And you can come up with things that have the form 1 to infinity that go to infinity, that go to 1, and this one goes to e. That goes to e. And so this brings up, so in college algebra, ideally your teacher sort of talked about things like this. Like if you, this number here is always bigger than 1, right? 1 plus 1 over x is always bigger than 1. And you already know that if you had something like this, 1.1 .1 to the x, if you took the limit of that as x went to infinity, what would happen here? Yeah, it's going to go to infinity. Anything bigger than 1 when you start All repeatedly right. multiplying it by itself, it's going to grow without bound. And you also know that if you had something where the base is under 1, and you took this limit as x goes to infinity, that's going to be 0. zero. You take something that's truly fractional and you multiply it by itself, it gets even smaller. And so that's the sort of conundrum in college algebra. You're like, oh, well, this is, if, this, if this base is bigger than 1, it should go to infinity. If the base is less than 1, it should go to 0. Now, this base is variable, but it is always bigger than 1, so that most people's instinct would be that, oh, it probably goes to infinity. And that's one of the cool things that we discover in college algebra is that, ooh, that does not go to infinity, it goes to E. Right? And that's where you get all those interest rate formulas, the principle, what it, per P times E to the RT, all those things. Um, and we can generalize this, and we will generalize this, and the generalization of this, which we will see, if you have 1 plus A over X to the BX, does anyone know where that goes as x goes to infinity? If we you know, stick an extra random constant here and stick a random constant there, B. it goes to e to the ab. So if we have random constants in there, you can generalize it a little bit. But we will talk about that indeterminate form later. <clears throat> but it will, that one will come up. So for these improper integrals, the ones that we tend to see are the infinity over infinity and zero over zero. Those are the two common ones. Okay, so our summary of improper integration. I've got graphs here. The black curve is one over x. And what we've seen is the black curve, the one over x curve, that's sort of our threshold function. It, the black curve is going to have divergence 
infinite area between 0 and 1, so this vertical tail is infinite, and the black curve has a horizontal tail that's infinite. So 1 over x is infinite in both tails, the vertical tail and the horizontal tail. And if you look at the red curve, the red curve is 1 over x to the 1.1. 1 .1. So if that power on x is a skosh higher than 1, then you're going to have convergence horizontally but divergence vertically. And you can see right, this is smaller than the black one, so it's, not, so, you know, it's reasonable. That's going to be finite. But it's further away from the y-axis in the black curve, so it also has to be infinite because there's more area between the red curve and the y-axis than the black curve and the y-axis. And if the black curve and the y-axis has infinite area, certainly the red one does because it's further away. And then vice versa, if we make the exponent on the x in the denominator a skosh under 1, then the curve does the opposite. It peels away from the x-axis, creating an infinite area for the horizontal tail, but it pulls it in closer to the y-axis, so you end up with a finite vertical tail. So there's our threshold function, a little bigger, converge, diverge, a little smaller, diverge, converge. So they're always doing opposite things. So that kind of just summarizes the idea there. And then we had mentioned this a couple days ago. So this is the improper integral that you will see the most in an engineering career. In an engineering career, this improper integral, the Laplace transform, is going to show up a ton. And when you look at this right here, what you should be seeing is that the Laplace transform is a function of s. The t is a dummy variable. The t is inside the integral. That's going to vanish with the limits. And you are going to end up with this function of s. And if you look right here, that e to the minus st, that's an exponentially decaying function that's approaching the x-axis very quickly. And so the idea behind the Laplace transform that you're going to see is that this function f of t doesn't even need to be continuous. This function is not necessarily even continuous. Um, it's not even differential. It's not differentiable. It's not necessarily continuous. It can be a step function. And when you multiply it by this e to the negative st, what happens is this l of s turns into a continuous function, which is so interesting that you can take a discontinuous function multiply it by this exponential decay function, and then integrate, and this is going to give you a continuous function. You can do math on it, and then you can come back to t after you figure out what's going on in s. So this is the one that you're going to see most frequently. This is why improper integration is so important, because you will see it a lot as an engineer. Laplace transforms are super important. OK, so that is improper integration. Now you can do everything on the worksheet, for sure. We'll have it due Monday night by midnight. I'll get them graded. Can I get them graded by Tuesday morning so that you can then get them back to me by Thursday? We'll see. I might have to pull an all-nighter. I might need some. Is there some drug that will keep me awake? Well, then let's uh, yeah. go caffeine. Oh, OK, I'll go with caffeine. Yeah. Yeah, that one seems like a safe one. You can other work stream ones. <laughs> <laughs> give us all fives. Or I could just assume that you did it right. Yeah, you almost yeah. did perfect. All right. Well, I could grade it with my goggles on. Yeah, but that's, I, I that's not a drug, though. That's not a drug. You, that's I, I, you could get drunk and then everything looks good. I could get yeah. drunk and then you <laughs> really use the beer goggles. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. five, five, yeah. five. I like a minimum sleep. So it's always minimum, sleep. yeah, minimal minimum, sleep. A minimum sleep count. Now, I'll go to bed by a certain time to get at least three and a half hours. Yeah, I usually get at least three so and a half hours. I, I'd like to propose a different strategy. Uh oh. You fail me on this yeah. and teach me on Tuesday because I think that's more important than five points. Okay, all right. Teach you on Tuesday before class or during class? The, during class. During class. Yeah, okay. I just want you cohesive and coherent. Coherent? Yeah, Not stumbling Not around. I pulled yeah. an all nighter. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had pulled an all nighter in a while. Okay. I'll take a zero on that. <laughs> take a zero. Okay, so chapter nine. We're only covering two sections, and we are covering, again, in just the very basics of differential equations. We used to not cover these two sections in Calc 2, and I, still, I feel a little suspect that it's the right thing to do. It's not, it fits in okay, 
but it sort of takes a little bit away from uh, power series, which are you know, really important. And when you take your differential equations class next semester or whenever you take it, you of course are going to cover this from the beginning. Differential equations is always taught from the beginning. So we're just going to do a very, very basic differential equation idea here, the simplest stuff. Um, and this, again, is a topic that you will see very frequently as an engineer. Differential equations are basically the, that, that's, what dif, that's what engineers are dealing with most of the time. You go out into the real world, you measure some sort of data, how fast is the water moving, how quickly is something happening with respect to time. That builds you a differential equation. A differential equation is like a rate equation. And you did a little bit of that kind of rate equation stuff in Calc 1 when you did related rates. And you're trying to find a function that satisfies that rate equation, that differential equation. And if you can find an equation that satisfies that rate equation, the differential equation, if you can find an equation that satisfies it, then you can predict the future, which is always a good thing. So, it is a topic that you will see littered throughout your engineering courses, this idea of differential equations. Now, we are dealing with differential equations in the simplest sense. We're dealing with uh, functions of one variable. When you get into calculus two, uh, three, when you get into calc three, you deal with functions of more than one variable. That's what a surface is. A surface is a function of two variables. So your domain is the xy plane, and then your, function, your z value is your function value, and it creates a surface. Right? So that's a function of two variables. When we talk about derivatives in here, that's a one variable idea. When we look at a curve, the, diff, the, the derivative is oh, it's just finding the slope of this tangent line. Right? And there's only one direction. You're moving in this direction as x gets bigger. You're saying, okay, as we go this way, the slope of that is whatever it is. When you get into Calc 3, you have a surface. If you're standing on the surface, you have 360 degrees you can walk. There are 360 different de derivatives. The derivative is measuring the best linear approximation in a particular direction. You'll call it a directional derivative instead of just a derivative. And so that's the idea, though, that when you get to a surface, there are lots of different directions that you can find the rate of change in. And so that is a multivariable function. And instead of a derivative, you will have these things called partial derivatives. Because you could go this way, you could go this way. So any direction that you pick is a partial derivative you know, from the entire derivative. There will be something called the total derivative also. So. Here we are going to look at the simplest possible functions. We're just trying to find a function of one variable. You have to take a class, and most students that get deep into the multivariable thing take ODE1, differential equations 1, ODE2, differential equations 2, and then PDE1. That's where you get into the multivariable stuff, partial differential equations 1. And if you're a total you know, differential equations freak, then you take PDE2. <laughs> So there's a lot of differential equations that you can take depending on which way you go in your engineering major. So for us, you know, here they give you a bunch of examples. Differential equations are basically you know, the language of science. For us, we want to get down to some definitions first. So we're going to talk about the order of a differential equation and whether it's linear or not. We throw this word linear around a lot in math, and it means different things in different, different contexts. So first off, the order of a differential equation <coughs> is nothing more than the highest derivative that appears. So whatever the highest derivative that appears, that is the order of it. So when we look at this equation right here, the only derivative that we see is y prime. Right? There's no y double prime, there's no second derivative, there's no third derivative. So this is a first order differential equation. So it's first order because the highest derivative that we see is first order. The second equation, we see a y double prime and we see a y prime. So this is a second order differential equation because the highest derivative that we see is a second order derivative. Okay, so that's order. 
Now linear, slightly different animal. So it's linear if the unknown function y and its derivatives appear only to the first power and they are not composed with other functions. So let's just get, try to understand what that means. So when we look at this first equation, here is the derivative, here is the function. There's no square on them. There's no square root on them. They're not multiplied by each other. They're not commingling with each other. So we have the y and the y prime separate and raised to just the power of one. So there's no funny business. They're not composed with each other. They're not inside of a square root, nothing funny. So that is what makes it linear. So totally different from mx plus b. You know, and there's other, word, other things that will be called linear also that are just different. So for linear, when we're talking about a differential equation, it means y and its derivatives are by themselves. They're raised to the first power. They're not inside other functions. Now, and that's the same case down here. We've got the y double prime there. We've got the y prime there. So we've got that one, we've got that one, and we've got that one. And they're not squared, they're not square rooted or anything funny. So that is linear. Now you're looking at these coefficient functions here. These things can be wonky. Those are functions of the independent variable t. So y is a function of t. We're trying to figure out what y is. It's a function of t in both of these. These coefficient functions can be completely off the chart, wild and crazy. That's fine. The t's can be crazy. But the y, the y prime, and the y double prime have to be nice and isolated and not crazy. You can't have y squared or y prime squared. They have to be just to the first power. But these t functions can be totally crazy. So those are the two words that we learned on this slide, order and whether something is linear or not. <coughs> so let's take a look at this. So here is an example of a function. So there's a function. Here is differential equation. And let's just understand the basic idea. The basic idea is that a function satisfies the differential equation or it doesn't. Right? It's kind of like whether a point is on a line or not. Well, if you stick in the coordinates of the point and you get something true, then the point is on the line, that, that idea. If we take a function and we take its derivative and we plug that stuff into the equation and we get something true, then that function is a solution to that differential equation. It's not telling us how we got that solution, but this at least is just sort of giving us that general idea. That's what we're doing. So when we look at this function right here, we can take its derivative. So we have 3ct squared, that's the derivative. And if we want to know whether y satisfies this differential equation, we take y, we take its derivative, plug it in, and see if we get something that's true. So let's check. Do we get something that's true? So we have t multiplied by y prime. Well, we just found y prime. Minus 3 multiplied by y. And y is um, ct cubed. And we don't know, is this true or not? We don't know, so we put a question mark over the equal sign. That's what we want to know. Is that true or not true? We'll simplify stuff that we can simplify. So we have 3ct cubed minus 3ct cubed. We get to this stage, and then we get to 0 equals 0. That checks out, so it is a solution. That's it. So that means that that, that function y, this function of t, satisfies this differential equation for every value of c. So there's an, you know, it's just like when you're taking an integral. There's an infinite collection of functions that satisfy. Same idea with differential equations. You're essentially integrating. And c can be any real number. All right, so that's, that's the general principle. Let's look at this one. So here's our function. Here's our der uh, derivative equation, our differential equation. And this one has a couple of extra features. We've got these initial values. So we want to make sure that both of those are satisfied also. 
And so just like when you're doing an integral, if you are given some sort of initial value, that allows you to solve for c. Right? The initial value is what allows you to find one antiderivative instead of the whole family of antiderivatives. Right? That's, what, that, that's what these initial values do. They let us pinpoint one of the many antiderivatives. So that's, which we, we did in the first week of the semester when we were doing those uh, velocity and acceleration problems. Okay, so like this one we didn't have initial values, so we just have a general antiderivative. All right, so here, same idea. We're going to take our function's derivatives, so we get y prime. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. So we're going to have minus 3 sine of 3t, and then we use the chain rule, and we multiply by 3. Positive sign, right? Because Positive, right? Because it's already negative. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so it's negative here, and then the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we get a negative and a negative, which makes it positive. Correct. So there is the y prime function, and this is a second order differential equation. So second order. Notice that this one is a first order linear. So it's first order because we have the highest derivative is the first derivative. And it's linear because y prime and y are not raised to any powers and are commingling. This is a second order differential equation. Second order because we have a highest derivative of order 2. And it's linear because y and y double prime are not commingling with anything. No, they're, no, they're not composed with anything. OK, so y double prime. 27 cosine of 3t with the chain rule. So now we plug the function and its derivatives into the equation and see if we get a true statement. So let's check that out. So y double prime, so we have 27 cosine of 3t plus 9 multiplied by uh, y, the original function. And we don't know, is that equal to 0? Yes. We multiply it out, we get 0 is equal to 0. So that checks out. So that means that that is a solution. That's a general solution to the differential equation. So that function y is a general solution. Now they gave us these particular values. Let's double check to see if those are on track also. So let's see. So is the initial value problem also satisfied here? So y of 0 is negative 3. So let's check. There's the y function. So we're going to put in the 0 and see what we get. So we're going to have negative 3 cosine of 3 times, let's see, 3 times 0. And that is equal to negative 3 times cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. OK, so just checking that these initial values are, in fact, what they they are, in fact, what they claim they are. So that one checks out. y of 0 is, in fact, negative 3. And then if we check the other initial value, y prime of 0, same idea. We go to the derivative. We're going to get 9 sine of 3 times 0. Sine of 0 is 0, so we get 0. And that also, che that also checks out. OK, so that means that this function with these initial values is a solution to the initial value problem. Both initial values make sense. And the function and its derivatives satisfy the equation. So that's all it means for a function to be a solution to a differential equation. Now, how do we do it? How do we find these? these solutions? Well, in the simplest sense, you integrate. Like right here, if your differential equation can be written so that the derivative is all by itself on the left-hand side, you undo the derivative to get to the function by integrating. So this is what we you've already been solving differential equations. This 
will be the solution to that differential equation. That'll be the general solution. When we say general, it means there's going to be a C in it. And the C is just an arbitrary constant. So essentially, we're integrating both sides here. And we know how to integrate this. This will be 3 times t. And then the integral of an exponential is itself divided by the derivative of the exponents. We have to divide by negative 2. And then we add our constant of integration. So there is the general solution, the general antiderivative, the family of antiderivatives, lots of ways to think about it. And if we were given some condition, we could plug in the values from that condition and solve for C. So that initial value allows you to find the one antiderivative. This is an infinite collection of antiderivatives. But in its most simplest form, the solution to a differential equation is found by integration. But you can only solve a differential equation with basic integration if the derivative can be isolated all by itself on the, on the left-hand side. So like this right here, if we had a y double prime and a y prime and a y, you couldn't do this. We can only do this if there's one derivative function and it can be isolated. So then you can just find, then you can solve it by integration. So y prime, if we integrate once here, that's going to get us to y prime. So if we integrate that, that'll give us to y prime. Why don't you guys finish this one off? Find y prime, and then continue on and find y. Make sure you can do that. Is it possible to have the worksheets due on Monday by noon? Probably then I could easily grade a Monday night and have them back to you for Tuesday. Would Monday at noon be okay? I'm like almost done with it, so. That would be okay? Yeah, I finished this. Yeah. Okay, so Monday at noon would be better for me, and then I can make sure that I can get them all graded by Tuesday. And then we can talk about any issues on Tuesday during class if there's anything that comes up. <clears throat> You write the constant, or just you can take the integral of that. And then it just be times x. That's not Is there a special like constant if you integrate a c? Oh. If you have two unknown constants, we usually go to C1 and C2. So if when you integrate to get to Y from there, do you have to integrate the C as well? Yes. Yeah, so, then so we'll have a C1T as part of the Y. That's right. Yeah, so if we think ahead, if you, have, if you know you have a second order different, if you're going to integrate twice, you know you're going to have two unknown constants. So it kind of gives you the idea, oh, okay, let's use a C1 instead of just a C. Yeah. So we should be getting y equals the integral of this thing. So any questions on getting to this antiderivative? Any of the steps there that you're befuddled by? 2t squared. Right. Maybe. Uh, let's see. t squared, 2t squared. Yes, thank you. So that will be our function. That is the function that we're looking for. That satisfies the differential equation. 
and then you'd want an initial value for y prime and, and for y to get those two constants. That's right. So if we wanted to find a particular solution instead of a general solution, we'd need those two initial values. You couldn't do it with just an initial value for y? Because you, nope. Yeah, you'd end up with a system of... <laughs> with, we'd, still end up, we'd end up with one unknown then. Gotcha. Unless it... Actually, if it's zero, then I guess the C1 cancels out, but you'd still have one. Yeah. yeah, so if you don't have two initial values, you can't get all the way to one answer. You can narrow it down. So, yeah, this, this chapter, the stuff we do is very, it's more sort of an, it's not, it's not, you're not learning anything too deep. It's more sort of learning some vocabulary, learning some basic ideas, a different way to frame the idea of integration. Of course! Every class. 10 o'clock! 10 12. 10 12. Every day. At this point, I'd be worried if it doesn't happen. Yeah, I can give him a ticket. I'm always worried. Improper Zamboni dragon. Okay, so here is one with initial value. Right? Disorderly conduct. Can you go give him a ticket for that? I'm not an officer, though. You're not? But, but at least know that if you're like making a bunch of noise, you can be in charge of disorderly conduct. Right. Yeah. All right, you all try this one. So solve that initial value problem. And basically, it's really not like, like people tattle on each other. Exactly. Call on your neighbors. They're partying too loud. Wait, are you suggesting getting me fired as hilarious? Oh. Put a four. Y of zero is four. So there's the initial value. It's a little practice integrating. I just realized you weren't sitting there. You're going to be trapped out there with these <laughs> With reverse chain oh, yeah, rule, yeah, yeah, yeah. are you dividing by two or multiplying by two with reverse chain rule? Divide, Divide by two, right? So when we integrate this, y of t will be the integral. And as you've noticed, as you've taken all these math courses, there are times that you write your independent variable inside and you write y of t, and there's other times you just write y, and sometimes you write y of x, and sometimes you just write y. It doesn't matter, right? It's totally up to you. If it is easier for you to realize that y is a function by putting the of t, then do it. If it doesn't matter to you, then don't, you don't have to do it. It's kind of your preference. It does not matter, though. There's no difference in the meaning. So we've heard the integral of cosine, excuse me, the integral of sine is minus cosine. The integral of cosine is sine of the same angle, but then we do our reverse chain rule, and we get that, and then we get plus C. So that is our general solution. And then we can get a particular solution, we can get one solution with those initial values, or with that initial value. So this initial value will allow us to pick the one antiderivative that satisfies the whole thing, including that initial value. So let's plug it in. So it says y of 0 is 4. So it tells us that y is 4 when we plug in 0 for t. So that's what that initial value is saying. When you plug in 0 for t, your y value is 4. <coughs> And that'll allow us to isolate C. 
We know that sine of zero is equal to zero. That's equal to zero, so that's gone. Cosine of zero, that's equal to one. So we're going to get c is equal to five. And then we could write our general solution, excuse me, our particular solution, our particular solution will just have the C replaced with the 5. That is probably e to the 0. That's right. I got e to the 0 over 0. That feels wrong. Yeah. Any piece of that integration? The feel like we want the whole test to be this? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> all right, you all tried this one, this second order linear differential equation where we can isolate the y double prime. We can solve this differential equation with a pair of integrations. And we have initial values over here to get a particular solution. So find y. Where's y? Find y. Let me know if you're snagged on anything, I can give you a nudge. I did hundreds of my parts. And so we have the product, product and there's not an obvious U right. substitution. Then that so T integrates to DT by parts, or drive, drive, drives to DT. Okay. And Some ultraviolet voodoo. Yeah. Ah. Time for a little voodoo. And then incredibly conveniently, uh, the challenging part of the second. I wonder if there's a question that. Uh, can include almost as it's much as our content as possible. I think we've gone over, like you said, partial sums and don't give them any ideas. Like the side of a, uh, of this and side of t finding the area underneath something. Right, because t times e to the t. Yep. So that's uh, okay. Like one no, plus one not over t. That combines everything. So one problem you don't all. do over the variable. Over any concept. Yeah, we can think. Don't go ahead and don't think about that. Right? No. Here's one question for your test. Please don't. <laughs> one question Please don't. that yes, includes no, integration by parts and improper right. integration and differential not equations. Well, one trick sub in there. Why not? Some, some trick sub in there. And you know what? Rotate around an axis. Rotate around. Combine some trick sub with integration by parts. And an axis rotation. Yeah, that sounds terrible. For you <laughs> to have to do all that. Think about your grading for that. I know, right? <laughs> it's going to be a mess. 92, so, yeah. you lose a point. And then how do you do zero? Zero is equal to zero minus zero. Oh, I don't want to. Zero plus two. Wait, no, no, not to go to zero. Um, 
So there is your first integration by parts. Hopefully that wasn't too crazy. The logic here, which goes where, the most complex thing that you can easily integrate is e to the t. And you put the t over there, and when you differentiate the t, the t goes away, which simplifies the subsequent so integral. You get uh, e to the zero is one, right? Yeah. Plus c1. So one is equal to zero minus one plus c1. Oh. So c I put in the wrong thing. So both c's are equal to I'll get it all right. I can make So did everybody get that same y prime? t e to the t minus e to the t plus c? All right, so then to get y, y is going to be the integral of that whole thing. And I'm going to put a c1 here. We'll do the constants at the end. You could actually take a break right now and find the first constant if you wanted to. You could. But let's just do them all at the same time. And one reason we would want to do that is that sometimes they want us to find the general solution and the particular. So let's go ahead and find the general solution first, and then we'll start evaluating. <clears throat> so once again, we end up with a product. And to integrate a product that doesn't readily integrate with u sub, we have to use integration by parts. Isn't that the exact same one you've just integrated? And it's going to look exactly the same. So if you want to be clever and you know, you know that the integral of that piece is going to be that, right? So integral of t e to the t is going to be a t e to the t minus e to the t plus um, a constant. So we'll, we'll combine the constants together. So then the integral of that right there is e to the t. The integral of that is c1 times t, and then we have our second constant. So you can think about each of these integrating. If you integrate separately, you know, you could have multiple constants, but you just think of it as one constant of integration for the whole thing. That's the c2. OK, so that is our general solution then. So this is general. And then we can find the particular solution by finding the C1 and the C2. So let's go up there. And if we use the derivative one, we'll use this equation and find C1. So let's go ahead and do that. So it says that y, uh, y prime of 0 is 1. So y prime is going to be 1 when we plug in 0 for t. So we're plugging in 0 for all of these t's. 0 times anything is 0. e to the 0 is 1. So we get that c1 is 2. And then we're told that y of 0 is 0. So we come down here. There is the y equals 0, the left side. And then on the right hand side, we're plugging in 0. So that first term is 0. The second term is negative 1. Oh, I guess we could have combined those two things. What are you getting for your C2? Also 2. Also 2. So there is our second constant of integration. And so then our particular solution The particular solution is y equals t e to the t minus 2 e to the t. Let's combine those two. Come on, 2 e to the t. Uh, positive 2 is our limit, was our constant of integration in both cases. So there is the particular solution. Not too bad. Not too bad. Makes sense. <clears throat> All right, any questions? So that's the final answer, right? We don't have to, I guess, box the other two. Like you. Uh, so this is the the so the question most likely is going to say, what is the general solution? 
And what is the particular solution? Oh, so yeah. you, it's going to, going to include both. Gotcha. Yeah, it's going to include both. But if it was in the field in a job, we would want the particular one. Right, because that's going to be the data from the client. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at our first real technique that's not just integration. So we've really just sort of reworded what we've been doing for the last semester already, the last since count one. Okay, so our first real technique is solving a separable differential equation. A separable differential equation is one where all the x's can be pulled to one side and all the y's can be pulled to the other side, or t's, whatever the letters happen to be. So when we look here, this is separable, so we're going to rewrite the y prime as a we're going to rewrite the y prime in differential form, so as dy dx or perhaps dy dt, depending on what the independent variable is. And we want to separate. This equation is not separated yet because I have a dx on the left. So by separated, we mean that we want all the y's on one side and all the x's, including differentials, separated. <coughs> So that is considered separated. We've got the y, the function of y and the dy on the left. We've got the function of x and the dx on the right. This should look a little bit like integration by parts. Right? With integration by parts, we have the du and the dx. Get them on separate sides of the equation. It's kind of that idea. All right, so let's try one. So the first thing, when I look at this, I say, oh, it's a first order and linear. So it's first order because the biggest derivative is just the first derivative, so it's order one. And it's linear because this derivative is not commingled with the function or you know, a power or anything funny. So it's linear and it's first order. But you might say, couldn't we solve this using the technique that we just used? And the answer is yes. Right? You could just divide by e to the 4t and you'd have a regular, you'd have your y prime isolated. But we're going to do it, we're pretending that we're, we don't see that or we don't want to do it that way. So we're going to write this as dy dt equals 5. <clears throat> and then we want all the y stuff on the left and all the other stuff on the other side. So dy is all by itself on the left. We certainly have to push the, the, five, the uh, dt over to the 5. So the dt has to go to the right. We need a differential on both sides. And then the e function, that gets moved over here as e to the negative 4t. So now we've separated it. And once it's separated, then the idea is that you integrate both sides. You integrate the left side with respect to y, the right side with respect to t. And that will work. So we end up with y equals negative 5 divided by 4 e to the negative 4t plus a constant of integration. So that is the general solution. So we call that the general solution because there's a c in it. That is the general solution to that separable differential equation. Now let's do one that's a little more interesting. So this one has the, the situation where you could isolate the y prime. If you divide by x squared, you've got the y prime isolated. But there's not just x's on the left, on the right hand side, so you couldn't just do regular integration. Right? You can't just isolate this y prime and then integrate both sides. So this one we definitely need to do this technique of separation of variables. So we have that. And there's no ambiguity with what side the dx has to be on, right? The dy has to stay in the numerator, so it's going to stay to the left. The dx has to go to the right hand side. All right, so we're going to have dy, and the y's have to go left. So I'm going to divide by the y squared. 
I'm going to multiply by the dx, but then I'm also going to divide by dx squared. Now it's separated. So we've got the y's on the left with the y differential, the x's on the right with the x differential. And then we do the integration of both sides. Left side with respect to y, right side with respect to x. You may need to rewrite, you know, depending on your, just depends. Some people don't need to put it in the numerator. Most folks prefer to have that rewritten like that before doing the power rule. So on the left-hand side, we're going to get minus 1 over y. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. On the left side, excuse me, on the right side, we get minus 1 over x, and we need a constant of integration. Generally, we just put it on the right. You don't need one on each side. Constant and constant just turns into one constant. So you only need one constant of integration here. Okay, so this is a general solution, but it's not in explicit form. Whenever possible, we want to isolate the y. So right now, it is general, but it's not in explicit form. We would say that this is an implicit form. We haven't isolated the y. The y is just sort of embedded within the equation. So we want to do a little bit more work. We want to isolate the y. We want to get an explicit solution. Explicit means y is equal to whatever. So here we go. On the right-hand side, we need to get a common denominator. The common denominator would be x on the right-hand side. So I'm going to multiply by x over x. Multiply this by x over x to get the right-hand side. And I'm going to just make both sides a ratio. If both sides are written as ratios, then you can just flip both sides. So we can flip both sides now. So now we have y over negative 1 equals x over negative 1 plus cx. <coughs> just flip both sides. Now we want to isolate the y to get our explicit solution. When you multiply the right-hand side by negative 1, you can put it in the numerator or you can put it in the denominator. And if you put it in the denominator, you would rewrite it like that. Uh, no, you just rewrote it the same way. I did? Oh, I did, didn't I? It would just be 1 minus CX. Yes, thank you. I just rewrite it exactly the same. Do just as I say, way. not as I do. Yeah, multiply by negative 1. We can put it in the top, put it in the bottom. If we put it in the bottom, we distribute it, and it would look like that. So this, we would say, not only is it a general solution, but it is also explicit. So that is a general, that's our target. General, explicit, whenever possible. Can you go back up to 6? Why did we go from e to the 4t to e to the because um, you divided by e to the e minus it, right? So we divided both sides of this equation by e to the uh, 4t. Oh, which then switching to the side. Or if you wanted to, you could think of this as multiplying each side by e to the negative 4t. Ah, just to isolate the y's. Mm -hmm. That makes more sense. If you do that, then this becomes e to the 0, which is 1. Make sense? And then multiplying both sides by dt as well. And then the dt floats. All right, let's take a break. Take a break. We're getting through it past that problem. Excited. Okay, so looking at this first one, let's first just rewrite it with differentials. So this would be dy dt equals e to the ty. All right, spend a few seconds separating it first. How would you separate that? Um, divide both sides by dt. 
by the natural one, but multiplied. And you get the exponent out of. Can we get that separated? Yeah, separated. Yeah, natural log. Yeah, natural log. So the natural log of dy is ty. Who thought that would be a good idea? Putting all these gnarly plus everywhere. Dt. You just something divided. You can just subtract them, right? Yeah. So then that becomes. You get separated. Dy minus. He wrote the paper. Natural log. So now if you no, natural no, log a differential, what happens? No. <laughs> you can't do it. Wait, you, you can just rip the paper and have it like... Rip the paper? Rip yeah, the paper where the lines on one side of the rip and then he's on the other side of the rip. You could do that. So is this separable? Yes. No. How? Multiply by natural log. <laughs> Multiply by natural log? Natural log is not a quantity. You take the natural log on both sides. How do you take the natural log? Yeah, what's the natural log of dy? Uh, it's just natural log dy? <laughs> <laughs> it's just L and dy. <laughs> I didn't say you had to solve it. <laughs> so, this, so the only way we could separate this is if somehow we could break this apart into an e to the t and an e to the y, but we can't. Right? If it was e to the t plus y, right, e to the t plus y, we could break that apart. That we could break apart into e to the t times e to the y. Then you have your y factor and you have your t factor. So there's no way to break this apart into two factors. So this one is not separable. Uh, serious question now. Why can't you just take the natural log of dy? Because our whole goal is to integrate, and well, when I mean, we yeah, yeah, but I mean you can do that. It's, it, you just can't integrate it afterwards. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So a, a differential equation will be called separable if you can separate it and get. So if we look back at the original definition, we want to get a dy on one not natural log of dy. We want to have a dy all by itself and a dx all by itself, so that you can integrate. You know, like. If you take natural log of dy, it just is meaningless. Okay, how about this one? This one is separable, right? Well, I don't trust you now, so. <laughs> Ooh, I had you trusting me for a little bit. That's more than I can ask for. Okay, so try to separate this one. So there's the differential equation. Again, it's a first order. See if you can get the y's on one side, the t's on the other. is separable. We can get the t's to the right by multiplying, we can get the y to the left by dividing, and then we can integrate both sides of this. So once we have it separated, we integrate both sides. And what is the left-hand side? The integral of that is? Uh, <laughs> one over y. Ooh. Natural log. Oh, yeah. Natural log absolute y. Dang. Don't listen to Tanner. Ne please never do that. Never listen to him. And then over here, we can use the power rule, so we get that. <coughs> so... So, so mad. So this is general because we have a C. And is this implicit or explicit? Implicit. And this is implicit because we have an isolated Y. So now our next goal then is to isolate y if we can. Now here we definitely want to do like a log exponential thing. 
What do we do to both sides to get rid of that LN? Inverse LN. Yeah, we inverse LN. Don't divide by LN, please. Raise everything to E. Yep, we exponentiate both sides. So if we want to use real math words, we call this exponentiating. <laughs> you shove it up into the exponent place. <laughs> And then you have to piecewise it to get rid of that? So this is where, this, so this becomes interesting here. So absolute value of y is either plus or minus the right-hand side. Right? That's not explicit. Explicit doesn't say plus or minus. Explicit is explicit. So here's what we're going to do. On the right-hand side, we are going to be clever and say that we could peel out that constant on the end, right? If this is a sum in the exponent, we could do that, right? And then e to the c is just another constant. And we can use the same c to represent it, even though it is now different. But that's okay, because we're never going backwards, we're just going forward. So that's just another constant, right? e to the c is a constant times that. And now on the left, we have absolute value of y. Absolute value of y is either plus 1 or minus 1 times the right-hand side. So it's either plus 1 times a constant or minus 1 times a constant, which is just yet another constant. So now we can peel off. We cannot peel off that absolute value until we have this c out in front. Once we have this C out in front, that C can absorb either the plus one or the minus one, whatever it needs to do, it can do. So now we've got the general explicit solution. General explicit. And this one did not have initial values, did it? Oh, we did. Okay, so now we'll do the general particular, excuse me, we'll do the particular explicit. Particular explicit. Math words are hard. I know, especially to put them in order. So y of 0 is 4. So here is our initial value, y of 0 is 4. So we're going to find the particular in explicit form. So we put a 4 in for the y. We put in a zero for the t's. This tells us that c is equal to 4. So we end up with y being 4 e to the t to the 4 plus t. That is now our explicit particular. those. Not too bad, right? It all of a sudden really feels like a 2,000 level class. <laughs> they shove a lot into calculus. Okay. You all do this one, so separate this one, if you can. Separate if you can.
patch and then you're going to go to the side to get it all right. Yep, that is legal. Totally legal. I mean, legal is good. Sometimes illegal is good. It all depends. Yeah, but what if you go to math jail? Math jail. That's a scary place. <laughs> All right, so there is our separated form. Any mysteries or questions? So you can remember that e to the negative y is 1 over e to the y. So you could write that as e to the x over e to the y. Totally fine. Multiply both sides by the e to the y. And now we'll integrate both sides. And when we integrate the left side, we're going to get e to the y. When we integrate the right side, we get e to the x. And then we need at least, well, we need one constant. We don't want two constants. One constant. So that is general because it's got a, it's got a c in it. And it's implicit because we haven't isolated the y. So that is general and implicit. So we're always going to be asked to find the particular, uh, to find the explicit solution if we can. What are we going to do to both sides here? Take the natural log, Take the natural log of both sides. Can we do anything? Can we simplify the right-hand side? No. It's already simplified. We can't do anything more. We can't distribute a log across the summation. So that's it. That is our general explicit solution. General and explicit. All right, so then we take the initial value, plop that in. So we're told that y is natural log of 3 when x is 0. So what does that make c equal to? 2. two. So that tells us that c is equal to 2. And therefore, our, ex our uh, explicit particular solution will be y equals natural log e to the x plus 2. That is the solution to the initial value problem. That's the particular explicit. Particular explicit. try another one here. We'll mingle this with another integration technique that we haven't used today yet. So usually it's a good idea just to rewrite the differential notation first. Make sure you don't divide by the wrong thing. <clears throat> so we want t's to the right. We want y's to the left. So dy over y times y plus 1. And on the right, we have 1 over t dt. <clears throat> that look OK? So it is now separated. We've got y's with the y differential on the left. We've got t's with the t differential on the right. We're ready to integrate, so we will integrate both sides. <clears throat> what technique are we going to use for the left? Partial fraction decomp, right? So partial fraction decomp, we're going to take 1 over y times y plus 1, and we want to rewrite that. We want to break away those two factors. We want to split those two factor, factors up. <clears throat> so we know that we're going to end up with the form is going to be a over y plus b over y plus 1. 
So PFD, partial fraction decomp. And these are both linear factors, so it should be a pretty easy decomp because we can use the convenient value method. So multiply both sides by that denominator from the right, and we'll get, or that denominator on the left, multiply it to the right. So we'll get that equation. And what are the two convenient values? Zero and negative one. Those are the convenient values. If we plug in negative one, for all the y's that we see, negative one plus one is zero, so that middle part goes away. Plug in negative one there and we get negative b, so that tells us b is minus one. <clears throat> Plug in zero across the board, and we get that the whole right-hand side, the only thing left is A. So now we've got our two constants. So let's get back up here. So the left-hand side becomes the integral of 1 over y. And then we have minus 1, so minus 1 over y plus 1 dy. The right-hand side, we can do the integration already. What is the integral of 1 over t? ln absolute value of t plus c. Plus c. And then we have a natural log of y on the left. Minus, uh, absolute y. Minus natural log absolute y plus 1. We don't need to put another C. That C can just get swallowed into the C that's already on the right. So that is general. And that is implicit. We would like to get to an explicit solution if we can. What do you think the first thing we're going to do in our hopes to get to an explicit? Combine the logs. Combine the logs and then exponentiate. So when we combine the logs, we end up with that. No, you exponentiate every term. Exponentiate the sides, which I guess you just put it Yeah, you could exponentiate right away if you wanted. So now we're going to exponentiate, and we cannot get rid of the absolute values yet. So we've got the absolute values around this, and we're exponentiating, and the entire right-hand side has to be up here in the exponent. And then we can do that clever trick where we're going to break this exponent apart like that <clears throat> using laws of exponents. And then e to the c is a constant. So we're going to have a constant times e. Oh, we can simplify that too, right? What is e to the natural log of absolute value of t? Absolute value of t. Now, absolute value of t is either plus 1 or minus 1 times t, so that plus 1 or minus 1 piece of it could get swallowed into the c. So we could write the left side as just c times t. And the c is going to swallow the absolute value from the left. So we can now end up with this. So are we going to be able to isolate t? Uh, excuse me, y? Let's see. We know how to do algebra 1, right? Oops. Wrong question. 
If we multiply both sides by y plus 1 and distribute, right, then we get y times ct and 1 times ct. Here comes the algebra 1. Get ready. Then we group all the y terms on the left. All the terms without y stay to the right. And then factor out, one. factor out the y. So we're going to have y multiplied by 1 minus ct equals ct. Now we can isolate the y. And we have, in fact, isolated y. So there is our general explicit solution. <clears throat> the initial value is y of 3 is 1. So once we have our explicit general, now we find our explicit particular. So this tells us y is equal to 1 when all the t's are replaced with 3. So now we have to solve that for c. <coughs> Calc 2, man. Algebra and trig central. So we have that, multiplying both sides by that right side denominator. Add and divide, and we get that c is equal to 1 over 6. So that tells us that y is equal to 1 sixth t divided by 1 minus 1 sixth t. which then needs to be simplified. We don't want complex fractions. So what are we going to multiply by to clear out that 6? Six? 6 over 6. Six. 6 over 6. Multiply by 1 in the form of 6 over 6. And that works beautifully because we end up with y equals t divided by 6 minus t. So now we have our particular explicit in reduced form. <clears throat> Why wouldn't you also multiply the Y by the one You see it? I see it. Very steezy that one. All right. Any piece of that that any of the algebra you want to ask about? Any of the algebra giving you headaches? Just all of it. All the algebra. All algebra. Now, of course, we've been talking about all this explicit form stuff, and obviously there is going to be times where you cannot find an explicit solution. So we leave them in implicit form. So here is one. It says solve the following initial value problem. Leave it, in ex leave it in implicit form. Use graphing software to plot the solution. If the implicit solution describes more than one function, be sure to indicate which function corresponds to the solution of the initial value problem. Wow, that's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. So. Maybe what I want, let's see, what do I have on the last page? <clears throat> let's, let's do this one first. This one I think will have a little bit more of a geometric flavor to it that might help us understand at least most of those words in that last solution, <laughs> in that last problem. Most of the words, maybe not all of them, but let's see. Let's do this one first. So here we can easily separate this 
So we get y dy equals negative x dx. <clears throat> Stop me if there's a piece that you aren't 100% sure on. We integrate. We get y squared over 2 is equal to minus x squared over 2 plus c. We move, so again, it's saying we're, we're going we're gonna, to, let's do this. Let's just bear with me for a moment. So do you agree that I could add everything to one side and I could multiply by 2? Multiplying by 2 is just going to get sucked into that constant? Yep. So x squared plus y squared equals c. This is an implicit solution. And it's general, so general, implicit. And what is that curve? A circle. Circle, right? Circle of radius root c. Right? The square root of c would be the radius. Now, they give us an, this initial value. This says that 0, 4. Moreover, these circles are centered where? 0, 0. At the origin, right? 0, 0. That's the center of all these circles. And they tell us that 0, 4 is on the curve that we want. OK, so let's just draw a picture then. So if we have this circle, and we know from the initial value that 0, 4 is on there, do you see that this Let's find the actual curve first, and then I'll, then I'll finish with the question I was just about to ask. So that says when we plug in x equals 0, we get y equals 4. So 0, 4 is on the curve. So we plug in 0 for x. We plug in y equals 4. All right, so we get that c is equal to 16. So that tells us that this circle has equation x squared plus y squared equals 16, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is the particular implicit can we get a particular explicit? The top half of this circle is a function, right? That's a function. Mm -hmm. This equation, x squared plus y squared equals 16, defines two implicit functions of x. Yeah. There is the upper semicircle and the lower semicircle. Both of those are functions of x. Mm -hmm. Now, x squared plus y squared equals 16 obviously is not a function. But there are two embedded functions. There are two implicit functions. And because this initial value locates the yellow part of the circle, we can, in fact, find the particular explicit solution. And that will be, we solve for y. So we get y squared equals 16 minus x squared. We take the square root, plus or minus, square root of all of that. And which one do we choose? Plus, plus, we plus. choose the plus one. Because the plus one is the top half. Gotcha. So here, we can, in fact, find a particular explicit. Oh. So you follow that logic? So the curve, the general solution, here we don't know which way to go. We don't know, should we choose the positive square root or the negative square root if we subtracted the six, the, the, if we subtracted, you know, if we moved the x's over here and took the square root, we don't know, positive or negative. But as soon as we've located that, that point, now we know that we want the top half, now we can actually find an explicit solution. So that's kind of what these words are getting at in this thing. That's what they're talking about. Now, did we do, is there another one on here? No, that's okay. So let's 
just start to do this one and we'll see what they're talking about. If you're given four zero instead, which lies on both curves, can you not get A? Great question. So we typically, when we write our functions, whenever possible, we write them as functions of x. So if four comma zero was given, yeah. we, we could write it as a function of y. So instead, we could isolate the x and say we're going to write x as a function of y instead of y as a function of x. Okay. So we would do it that way. Because it would be a point that lies on both x curves. Exactly. So there's no way to, so you, there's no way to really give the, there's no one best answer in that case. So let's go ahead and look at this thing. All right, separate. Not too bad to separate. So again, let's just rewrite it in differential form first, and then we'll, then we'll move stuff around. <clears throat> so there is our differential form instead of prime form. We're going to do some multiplication. I guess that's all we're doing. Multiply both sides by y squared minus 1. Multiply both sides by the dt. And then integrate. So we're going to get y cubed minus y, y cubed over 3, minus y equals 2 thirds times t cubed plus C. <laughs> now the first thing I want to do is just get rid of the 3. Having that fraction is a pain. So if we multiply through by 3, we can clean it up a little bit. And the C just stays as a C. Alright, so there is where we're at. We've got this general solution in explicit form. Is there any way we are going to separate and isolate the y here? No. There's no way here. We're not going to be able to just, you know, somehow do algebra and get down to a single y. Not going to happen here. So there is our general implicit. Let's see if the particular implicit can be rewritten like we rewrote on the last one. Let's check. So we're going to take our initial value the origin. So the origin is on this curve. So we plug in 0 on the left, we plug in 0 on the right. We see that c must be equal to 0. So therefore, our particular solution in implicit form is this. So that's our particular in implicit form. We don't recognize that curve. It's not a circle where we can grab top and bottom and, and, and really uh, do what we did with the last one. Okay, so we can't do that. Let's take a look at Desmos and graph it. So that's what they're saying, graph. And what was it? It was y cubed minus 3y equals 2 times cubed, or x cubed. So we'll go with x cubed. So there's our, <laughs> there's our beautiful curve. And when we look at that beautiful curve, we should see some implicit functions. How many implicit functions do you see? Between 1 and negative 1, and then above and below. How many did we say? Three. three. Three? Yep, three implicit functions. So here is a function that goes in roughly there. There's a function that's roughly there. And then there's a function that's roughly there. So we have three different implicit functions. We can look at our initial value, which is the origin. So the origin is right there. And, but we are not going to be able to get an explicit representation of that blue curve. 
You know, so graphically, we can you know, attach this and say, OK, well, it's that curve right there. So it's this curve restricted to the y interval. Where if we could find that y value. Maybe it's negative 1 and positive 1, it looks like it. So that, that curve restricted to y from negative 1 to positive 1. But we won't be able to come up with a formula that represents just that blue curve. Would you then want to write it as a function of y? Now, that would be a great option, right? So that's a great option because it does look like this is a function of, of y. So if we wanted to, we could isolate the t, right? And the t is to a cube. So you, when we look at that graph, it certainly appears that we should be able to isolate the independent variable t. Um, and when we come over here, you definitely could, right? You could isolate the t there. So. In this introductory chapter, they're not doing that, but when you get into a more complicated differential equations class, you could definitely you know, invert your dependent and independent variables roles, because that is a function of y. Yeah. All right, let's do our last one of these things. But it's interesting because we've been so, it's been so ingrained that, you know, oh, it doesn't pass a vertical line test, it's not a function. And, you, and so we're just using a slightly different perspective that, okay, it's not a function, it's actually two functions, right? That x squared, that circle, it's not a function, it's really two functions. So we're just changing our perspective a little bit. All right, let's try this one. So again, let's convert over to the differential notation. So the y prime becomes a dy dx because x is the independent variable. And then we're hoping that we can separate things and integrate without much difficulty. <clears throat> Let's go up here. So multiplying the y's to the left, that's not too bad. Is it becoming obvious that we're going to have to FOIL that out if we're going to integrate? So there's the left side. On the right side, we end up with 2x dx. Hmm. So that is how we're going to approach this. We'll then distribute the y, and we'll get to a place where we can definitely integrate. So now we have both sides written in forms that the integration step will be pretty easy. <clears throat> so then we integrate the left. We get 2y squared plus y to the fourth plus 1 over 6 y to the sixth equals x squared plus c. <clears throat> So that is our general implicit. Now this one, we're not going to be able to isolate y or t, or x, I guess, in this one. OK, so that's what we have. Now we're going to go ahead and deal with our initial value. So let's see if this somehow turns it into a form where we could get an explicit. So this tells us that when x is 1, y is negative 1. So if y is negative 1, the left side becomes that, and the right side becomes that. And so to me, I think we get c equals 13 over 6. The ones cancel, and 2 plus 1 sixth, common denominator of 6, 12 plus 1 is 13. So therefore, we are dealing with this curve 2y squared plus y to the fourth plus 1 sixth y to the sixth is equal to x squared plus 13 divided by 6. So there is our <coughs> particular multiplying 
And that is an implicit form. Yeah, we can multiply by 6 to clear the fraction. But there's no way we're going to isolate y or isolate, uh, well, we might be able to isolate x depending on, let's take a look at the graph. We might be able to invert our perspective. We just get plus or minus the square root. So Yeah, let's see if we can graph it. So we're going to graph this mess. So 2y squared. Whoops! Oh. What did that do? I love an anchor on. Yeah, what did I do? It's also one sig. What sig? Yeah, we'll put that down there. Gotcha. That makes sense. Equals x to the two space. Nope, not space. Tab. Plus thirteen divided by six. Um, All right. So there is our curve. That's the C. It looks so much nicer. You would not expect that to be so kind of symmetric and smooth looking. Well, all of your uh, maybe you would, are squared, right? Yeah, maybe you would expect that the square yeah. gives you symmetry. Yeah. Right, so X squared gives you vertical symmetry, and everything being y to an even power gives you horizontal symmetry. And what was our initial value? 1, negative 1? Which is... Bottom curve. It's on the bottom curve, so 1, negative 1, here is our initial value somewhere like right there. Okay, so that, even isolating x is not going to help us there because this is not a function of y. It's not a function of y. This is a function of x, this lower curve, but we're not going to be able to isolate the y to represent that function of x in a mathematical way. Nice. So we'd have to leave it in this form and just, you know know that the y has to be negative. So that's all we could do. So have to leave it in implicit form. What was the question? Did you say four y equations? Oh, you could, you could break this into four y equations, but we're not going to be able to get this one out of there. We can't. No, we're not going to be able to get a y equation for this, a y equation for that. A y, we're not going to be able to get that. But you could think of this for it. You could think of it as two y equations, too, right? The lower and the upper. I guess you could think of it as, yeah, you could think of it in a few ways. All right, there's differential equations in a nutshell. When you get into a differential equations class, you just ramp up the complexity of the differential equation. Jack the order higher than 2, create different weird coefficients that lead you down different paths. But in general, Diffie Q is going to be easier than Calc 2 and easier than Calc 3. You know, it's much more, you know, very problem solving oriented. It's kind of like cooking. You get a recipe for each particular differential equation and then just follow the recipe. You know, like with separable, okay, it's separable, follow the recipe to solve a separable. So it's uh, a. <clears throat> A lot, of, a lot of folks like the class because it's not quite as, you know, all over the place like Calc 2 and Calc 3 are. You know, it's a lot less, it's a little, way more contained. Way more contained. You're doing one thing. You're solving differential equations. That's the main concept. <laughs> okay, so let's, in preparation for the second exam, the uh, two most difficult topics, trig sub and implicit uh, improper integration. Those are the two most difficult things. So let's, let me pose a few, let's do, a, we have 15 minutes to practice, and uh, that's a good thing because these things are the hardest thing to do. So let's practice a little bit, and let me just copy that. Is it a test next Tuesday or next Thursday? We have another work, another study day. Yeah, our review day is Tuesday. 
Or the test is a week from today. Not okay. starting something new on Thursday after taking the test on Tuesday. That would be so mean. Break. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, I really <laughs> hope you remember that one topic. Right? For like one a full spring break. Yeah. That would be mean. Um, our spring break is so weird this year. It's it doesn't match weird. with anyone we know. Yeah, it's also <laughs> Our new college leadership had this great idea that because we have three campuses, we should be one college. So we're going to pick one spring break that doesn't align with anyone's district. <laughs> it's like, it's like it's a little sure. bit, a little bit crazy. No way, like even though all time before spring break, now spring break. That is what they did. They picked it so that it's right in the middle of the semester. Yeah, that makes more sense. That's what they did. <clears throat> But it's a drag if you have kids that are on a different spring break, or you have parents that are on a different spring break, or if you're taking classes, one at CU and one here, in the same district, but then you have different spring breaks. If you're at the Fort Collins campus and taking a class at CSU, your spring breaks are different. Like, it just seems crazy to me. Like there was a reason. Okay, so let's do... We haven't done trig sub in a, in a minute, so let's do a couple of trig sub examples. So one, two, one college, so I guess it works out for me. <laughs> yeah, it works out for you because you're at one college. <laughs> okay, so let's start by doing this one. Okay, so trigonometric substitution. When you are looking at an integrand and you see a difference or sum of squares, that is your first clue that trigonometric substitution is probably the way to go. So, that's a leading one, so it's sine. So it's going to be sine, that's right. It's going to be sine because we're going to turn it into a difference of squares with a leading one, and the identity comes from 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. <clears throat> or 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared. It doesn't really matter which way you think of it. So now the first thing I want to do, though, is make this a 1. It's going to be, there's less memorization in the long run if you understand how to do the algebra to create a 1 there. It's not how the book does it. The book doesn't care how much you memorize or how much you need to memorize. The book does not care. But in practice, if you can turn that into a 1, you are going to have to memorize less in the, wrong, in the long run. So that 9, I multiply this by 9 over 9, that 9 is in the denominator, so it can factor to the front. So what we're left so with then... Yeah, but what about the three halves? And that power has to come along with it. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Which is 127. But. Which we'll simplify in a second. So then we're left with 1 minus, and we want this to be a square... So what is that? x over 3 squared? And then that's the 3 halves. Right, so whatever we do pull out, the power has to come along with it, whether it's a square root or whatever it is. Fourth power, whatever the power is. <clears throat> so we can simplify that front number to 1 27th. We always, maybe always is a strong word, we usually trigger the denominator first, so square root of 9 is 3, and then 3 cubed is 27. And we've heard that we're going to use sine, so the only three functions we use are sine, secant, or tangent. It's the only three, sine, secant, or tangent. Tangent is with the plus, so it's got to be sine or secant. Difference of squares with a leading one is sine. <clears throat> so we're going to replace x divided by 3 with sine of theta. And that's a smart move because 1 minus sine squared will combine into cosine squared. So we're taking that multi-term denominator and smushing it into one term, which allows us to cancel common factors with the numerator. So that's why that's helpful. So we take our derivative here. We get 1 third dx is equal to cosine of theta d theta. Now we should be able to substitute, and in the numerator we have a dx. If we look at our dx equation here, multiply both sides by 3, that'll give us dx to be 3 cosine of theta d theta. And 
And then in the denominator, 1 minus sine squared, which is cosine squared. Let's write that first. So we have cosine squared of theta. All that's raised to the 3 halves power. Bless you. <clears throat> All right. So then we have a little bit of simplification. We can pull the constant of 3 out to the front, so we end up with a ninth. In the numerator, we'll get some cancellation in a moment. Let's just simplify this first. Cosine squared raised to the 3 halves power is cosine cubed. All right, power to power, multiply. Power to power, multiply, 3 halves times 2 is 3. So we're going to simplify this. We're going to end up with cosine squared in the bottom, which is secant squared in the numerator. Can we integrate secant squared? Do we know a function that has secant squared as its derivative? Tangent. Right? Integral of secant squared is tangent. All right, now we have to get back to where we started, x. So we have to create our triangle. Our triangle, if we always draw it as if it's a triangle in quadrant one, you will end up with the right answer. So we draw it like it's in quadrant one. We look at our substitution step. Sine of theta is x over three. Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, x over three. That is going to then give us a visual representation of how x and theta are related. And we can find the missing side here using the Pythagorean theorem. And that missing side should always match pretty closely something that's in your original integral. So the 9 minus x squared is in there. Now we can come up with the tangent of theta really easily. Tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. So we're going to get 1 9th multiplied by x divided by the square root of 9 minus x squared plus c. That's all true. That was a pretty easy one. You, a lot of times with trigonometric substitution, if you just make up a problem, <laughs> it might not work out that easily. It usually will not. Yeah. OK. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what was on the worksheet. Say that again? I'm pretty sure this exact problem. Is this one on the worksheet? I, it might not oh, maybe that's nine. why it's in my head. It might not be nine, but I think you do end up with cosine with over three halves. Okay, okay, squared. yeah, yeah. I, um, that might be why, because I was working on the worksheet not too long ago. It was kind of in my head. Yeah. All right, let's try another one. We'll probably just get to the setup. Well, so let's try something like x dx divided by something like the square root of x squared plus, let's definitely make that a perfect square. <laughs> and this one, I don't like that. This, is, this can be done with just regular u substitution, though. Yeah. yeah. But that's OK. Maybe we'll, it doesn't matter. Let's just do it with trig sub and anyway. But you could do it with regular. We don't have a lot of time, so we'll go with this being, we know that it's probably going to be easier than. And if you take the x away. So yeah, well, yeah, we could just take the x away. But let's leave it. Let's see what happens. Yeah. So we're pulling out a 16. The square root is coming along for the ride. So it's going to be 16 to the half. So the numerator is just staying. The, so all we're doing is trying to rewrite the denominator right now. And does everyone agree with that? Yes. So we're factoring out that 16. We're thinking of multiplying this by 16 over 16. And we're pulling that 16 out. Then we need to rewrite the x squared over 16 as a single square. So x over 4 quantity squared. Sine secant or tangent? Tangent. Tangent. It's got the plus. So x divided by 4 is tan of theta. Take the derivative of both sides. We get a quarter dx equals secant squared theta d theta. <clears throat> We end up with one quarter out in front. Let's see, what is x equal to? 
Four tangent theta. Four tangent theta. And then dx for secant squared of theta. And then we have a d theta. <clears throat> Down below, we have the square root of tan squared plus 1. So tan squared plus 1, that's secant squared. And the square root of secant squared will just be secant. So the 4's cancel will be left with tangent of theta multiplied by secant of theta. Does everyone agree? Because this denominator is turning into just a secant. And so that secant will cancel with one of the numerator secants. So we end up with sec tan. And what's the integral of sec tan? Secant. Secant. So that gives us secant of theta plus c. And then we've got to build our triangle so that we can get back to our x's. And we said that tan of theta was x divided by 4. So there is our visual representation of that substitution. Oh, you're missing one four. Uh, over here? Yeah. Oh, there's two fours up there. Thank you. But one cancels with the one. One cancels with that, and we are left with a four out in front. Yes. Because otherwise it would just mean that no matter what you put in the square root with the x squared, you always just get secant, which would be incorrect. Which would be not possible. And this becomes the square root of x squared plus 16. All right, and then we get 4 times secant of theta. Secant of theta is hypotenuse over adjacent. So we get 4 times the square root of x squared plus 16 divided by 4 plus c. Those 4s cancel, and we get the square root of x squared plus 16 plus c. So that works out pretty nicely. Perfect timing. Question? Oh, I'm just going to have some unpleasant talk in class. Oh, OK. I'll be here. I'm going nowhere. I won't. All right. Any other questions on this one? All right. Have a good weekend. Done, bro. It's supposed to be pretty nice this weekend. Don't let, let that distract you from studying math. And I will see you all on Potential Tuesday. That's not in my class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> distracted <laughs> driving. Doing math, don't get too distracted. Yeah, the other thing. All right, let me turn off the microphone. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you all Tuesday.